Chapter One of the Pocket Measure. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Pocket Measure by Pansy. Chapter One The Sum Total. It was just the speck of a house only four rooms all told and those so small that a housekeeper of the olden time rich in blankets and bed and table linen would have thought of them simply as good-sized closets a fashionable lady would have been in despair i doubt whether she could have found room for her trunks even reasonable present-day housekeepers with moderate views and small families would have looked doubtfully about them and wondered where the sofa would stand and what could be done about the large wardrobe and whether the piano could be gotten in at all but to mrs spafford the house was simply perfect i do not know that she would have had a door or window in it altered she had no piano and no large wardrobe and the sofa was just a cunning little box of a thing made by warren on leisure evenings there was plenty of room for their furniture indeed there was more room than they needed one the least sunny and the most exposed to northern storms had been closed and locked and the key hung on a far-up nail in the upper hall until such time as they could furnish the room when they said this they looked at each other and laughed hardly anything in life seemed more improbable to them than that they should ever have means to furnish that unoccupied room the furniture in their bit of a house, though so limited in quantity, had been the subject of much thought and care. Each individual chair, could it have spoken, would have had a history to relate. There were only six chairs. "'After all, what do we need of more?' Callie had said, putting on a sober face as soon as she could, after the laugh which their leanness had called forth. "'There are only two of us,' and we can't occupy more than a chair apiece and it isn't in the least likely that we shall have more than four visitors at a time even if we should they could sit on the sofa or on the bed warren had suggested and then the silly young couple laughed again so four of the prim little chairs had been duly installed in the parlor two of them to come out to the dining room at meal time but on other occasions when the dining room became a kitchen and washroom they would simply be in the way these four chairs with the meek little oval table and the homemade lounge constituted the furnishing of that parlor oh yes there was a carpet on the floor a pretty pattern small figured and pleasantly harmonizing colors not very fine it is true but decidedly pretty mrs callie spafford had studied over the pattern long enough to drive the impatient carpet clerk nearly to distraction for an upper hall ma'am he had asked her civilly enough when after long waiting and many thoughtful steppings from one roll to another she made the selection and named the number of yards astonishing the clerk by the smallness of the cut she had answered him quickly oh no with heightened color and then had turned quickly and bent over a roll of stair carpeting to hide the laugh in her eyes and also to avoid looking at warren for she knew by a peculiar little cough which he gave that he was laughing inside can i sell you a stair carpet today? the watchful clerk had asked her as he briskly rolled away the chosen carpet and gave orders concerning it to the cutter oh no said mrs spafford again speaking as quickly as before the idea of their buying a stair carpet and this time they did look at each other and laugh two young things just getting ready to play housekeeping said the clerk to himself as he grew interested and sympathetic and carpet clerk though he was followed them downstairs through the many departments of the great store advising suggesting reducing prices wherever it was possible and as interested in all the purchases as though they had been his friends for a lifetime he was gray-haired and he remembered the very morning he went with his wife and helped her buy dishes he sold dishes on this occasion with great care and by his timely bits of advice saved the young couple from several mistakes 
so little by little had the little house been furnished their sleeping-room was guiltless of a carpet one had been as much as their purse would allow and of course that must be given to the parlor but a bright rug of grecian pattern and of callie's own make occupied the bit of space between the pine-board washstand and the neat little bedstead these with the two chairs filled the room i have forgotten one article of furniture downstairs in the parlor over the mantel there hung one of those old paintings done in oil whose subdued colors and graceful outlines tell the touch of a true artist so did the eyes those soft tender almost speaking eyes which smiled down on you as soon as you entered the door and turned and followed you into whatever corner of the room you went a womanly face kind and tender and pure with certain lines about the sweet old mouth that told of quiet firmness and strong resolve and certain lines in the forehead which indicated that the resolves had been carried into action a motherly face placid now but suggesting the sort of rest that comes after one has gotten above the storms a rare work of art it was fit to grace the parlors of the wealthiest but the original was a rarer work of god fitted to grace the palace of the king and she had long since gone to take her place in the mansion prepared callie spafford's mother a woman who had lived and suffered and endured and come off more than conqueror through him that loved her and gone away to abide with him for ever leaving the memory of the strong true life she had lived to brood over the little new house where her daughter callie with the husband of her choice were to begin life together they sat down under the shadow of the dear face that first evening in the new home it had been a busy day and everything now was reduced to spotless order the little new tea kettle had been tried the small round table had been drawn out and callie had placed on it her finest tablecloth none of the finest though and they had sipped their tea and eaten their bread and butter and pretended to pass the cake and sauce to each other and laughed merrily over the absence of both and enjoyed to the utmost this their first meal alone together they were old married people that is it had been fully three months since they had publicly pledged themselves to each other since which time they had been as busy as bees getting their new home ready or getting ready for it hemming and hammering of evenings for all day callie had spent at her duties in the schoolroom and the husband stood behind the desk and worked at his rows of figures both husband and wife dreaming of the day when they should begin housekeeping now they had begun they sat in the pretty little parlor it did look wondrously pretty to them despite its barrenness and watched the play of light and shadow made by the dancing flames in the open grate and talked gaily at first then as the evening waned more quietly of their plans and prospects and hopes saying nothing either of them of any fears why should they have fears they had furnished their house and bought twenty-five pounds of flour and a bushel of potatoes and paid a month's rent in advance and they owed no man anything there is one thing warren that i want to talk to you about right away at the beginning of our life callie said drawing what she called their one extravagance a small light rocker of delicate workmanship closer to her husband's side and that is about our giving about our giving repeated her husband with a bewildered air and tone yes don't you think we ought to begin right about that as well as in other things assuredly little wife we want to begin as right as we can but what do you want to give away and who needs it what are you driving at why warren i'm not speaking about any particular person you know i mean systematic giving i want to begin as i hope we shall continue and give regularly to whatever christian people should support her husband tried to maintain a becoming gravity that is a very large desire of your large heart he said don't you know that christian people should support about a hundred charities more or less i know she said speaking quickly 
and i know of course it is very little we can do perhaps we cannot include them all but the more prominent ones we can give just a little to each of those can't we always provided we have anything to give he said speaking lightly you are to be provider you know i'll furnish the monthly installments every penny of it shall go into your hands i have enough to do with figures for other people don't want to make any for myself so i give you leave to contrive and scrimp and twist and turn ourselves and our clothes and if at the end of the month you have a blessed shilling left which i more than doubt you shall have my full permission to divide it equally on all the benevolences of our boards the comical side of this idea which had seemed to grow on him from the beginning of the sentence finally controlled him entirely and he closed the sentence with a ringing laugh i beg your pardon callie he said at last seeing that she joined his merriment only by a quiet little smile i began as soberly as a judge but the fun of the thing got hold of me why see here dear i believe i shall have to figure a little for your benefit after all now let's put it in black and white twelve dollars a month for this little nest and you know it was impressed upon us that it was ruinously cheap that is one hundred and forty four dollars a year to begin with now take coal these grades burn up a good deal one two well mind you i don't believe it possible to get through a year for twenty dollars and we'll call it that now suppose we put down our board at six dollars a week three apiece you know we can't keep it as low as that because there will be a friend dropping in now and then and accidents occurring whereby things will be spilled or spoiled oh i know you are a capital housekeeper i don't say i expect such things oftener than would occur in any well-regulated family but it is reasonable to expect a few such leaks there are fifty-two weeks in the year but we'll play that we go a-visiting for two weeks or fast and call it around three hundred without any calculation for leakages too low you see you would wear yourself into a shadow trying to keep within such figures but for the sake of the argument we'll put them down now clothes even wedding ones will wear out and dishes will break and pumps will go leaky and have to be repaired allow a hundred dollars for clothes and repairs yours and mine and the pumps you know it wouldn't furnish some of the ladies with one new gown but it will you now what is the sum just five hundred and sixty four dollars counting out those two weeks that we are to visit i don't know who on earth will visit do you but when you add to that an estimate for sickness and accident and car fare i declare i forgot car fare that will be let me see up and down morning and evening eight cents a day three hundred and what a pity there are so many days in the year but then it is a blessing there are so many sundays to take out eight times three twenty-five dollars as sure as i'm a mathematician who would have supposed it well now my dear benevolent little woman when you sum that all up and add something for ten thousand million things that we haven't thought of at all and that will spring up and insist on being paid for and subtract the amount from the enormous sum total of six hundred dollars what do you fancy will be left for us to be benevolent on during this rapid estimate of their worldly affairs callie had listened intently and laughed with her husband over the queer way of putting things but when he confronted her with that appalling sum total she met the laugh in his eyes with an undismayed face and with no abatement of the earnest look in her steady eyes that is all very true i suppose only my dear husband i think you began at the wrong end he regarded her with a good-humoured inquiry if there is any end to begin at that will make this sum total look more inviting i'm ready to be convinced he said gaily don't you see dear that you have planned for the daily living even to the burnt meats and sour bread and you have left the duty of giving subject to the accident of having something left after all our wants are supplied is that really the way her listener looked more and more bewildered callie dear he said speaking gravely i really have made a very low estimate 
and of course there will many expenses occur that we do not think of now do you see any way we could plan to avoid any of these or what have you in mind what is it that you think we ought to do i can tell you just what i would like to do i have been thinking a good deal about this subject of late studying about it and what i should be glad to do would be to begin now even with our little income to lay aside one-tenth of it for the lord one-tenth not even the solemnity of the conclusion could arrest the unbounded astonishment in his voice why callie dear have you thought what you are saying that would be sixty dollars how could we possibly spare it from our income and live we must live you know i know it warren and the lord knows it too and yet i believe if we should start out with that determination and adhere to it closely he would own and bless the offering i don't know dear i don't think i have your faith it seems to me that i ought to provide for my own household first isn't there something about a man being worse than a heathen who neglects to do that oh warren i don't feel in any danger of starvation and i do want to try this way it lies very near my heart i believe it is the right way to do that one verse has lingered in my mind ever since we were married ever since we planned this little home and thought of all the delight it would be i think we can do it your estimate of clothing i believe was larger than necessary i know how to be very economical in my dress what's the verse callie oh the verse it was jacob's vow and all that thou shalt give me i will surely give the tenth unto thee jacob well if i remember the circumstances he wasn't a very reputable party to imitate i never approved of his proceedings about that time nor for years afterwards oh but warren you remember how the lord blessed and prospered him i believe that one thing that jacob did was right and it is that i want you to imitate not the other part of his conduct warren i'll tell you i don't want to influence you unduly in this thing i should like it very much and i believe it is the right way and that we could accomplish it of course we could you know if it is the right thing for us to do but i won't urge it any further i'll just ask you to kneel down now while we set up our family altar and make it a special subject of prayer ask the lord jesus if he would like to have us give that sixty dollars back to him it seemed to the young husband a very startling way to put it he could have argued somewhat longer on logical grounds but to ask the lord jesus what he thought about it was making the thing a tremendously earnest one sort of obliging a man to abide by the reply which should be received nevertheless he felt unwilling to say that he was not ready to pray over it so they bowed before the lord for the first time in their new home it was an earnest prayer that followed a listener would have felt sure that the young man who prayed was very sincere and would certainly abide by the decision which should be reached and the tone of the prayer changed gradually from that of inquiry to something very like assurance so that callie was not surprised to hear him say as soon as they arose we will try it callie and see whether we can pull through but she promptly shook her head at this don't put it in that way warren as if we were willing to try the lord for a little while and see whether he would do as he said i know you don't mean that but perhaps it sounds like it to him let us take jacob for our model for this time at least i will surely give the tenth unto thee let us say it with the surely very prominent but callie dear that is very serious business an absolute promise you know it is of the nature of an oath and i am afraid we are poor to this his wife made no sort of answer only stood with hands clasping his arms looking up into his face with very grave eyes a moment of silence then he laughed i see precisely how it sounds callie as though i was willing to make a trial of the lord's service but unwilling to swing off entirely without a rope to cling to come now i swing off let's repeat it callie trusting in strength from him to make it good and seizing her hands 
he clasped them in his own and raised them in the attitude of prayer while both voices repeated the words and of all that thou shalt give me i will surely give the tenth unto thee end of chapter one chapter two of the pocket measure by pansy this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two their jewels among mrs Callie's wedding presents had been an elegant velvet covered gold mounted jewel case the gift of one of her school friends Callie had smiled when she saw it and speculated as to the amount it had cost and wondered when she would be likely to possess jewels elegant enough to repose in such grandeur the plain gold watch she wore and the simple pin and cuff buttons that did duty every day comprised the extent of her stock on the very morning after the new covenant relations had been entered into Callie went with bright eyes to the clothes press shelf where for want of a better place she had set the beauty carefully wrapped in many papers took off its wrappings turned the tiny golden key and looked in on the delicate pink cotton reposing there with intense satisfaction she had suddenly fallen heir to jewels which she meant should sparkle therein she took it downstairs with her and set it on the parlor mantel while she robed the little dining table and prepared the morning meal the tea kettle was already singing and the aroma of coffee and faint odors of delicately browning toast presently filled the air it was as complete a little photograph of eden as warren spafford cared to see so he thought at that moment as he pushed open the side door letting in the fresh morning air and bearing in either hand a scuttle of coal and a pail of water that were to save the steps of the presiding genius of eden during the day these were fresh healthy young lives and the prose which had constantly to interfere had no way jarred the poetry that they felt sure they were living his wife turned toward him with sparkling eyes oh warren i have such a nice idea isn't this the day your month's salary is due the very day you small miser i expect to bring it home with me this evening do you burn to spend it just as fast as i can she said gaily but see here and she brought out the blue velvet treasure warren don't you know how we laughed over poor florrie's gift and wondered what use we should ever make of it i have thought of a use you know that five dollars the tenth well could you bring it to me in little bits of gold dollars and let me keep it in here for our jewels then i'll wear the key on my chain and whenever we want to give the money will be at hand until it is spent he said in a tone of intense amusement five little bits of gold dollars every month our boards can surely pay off their debts when they hear of it my dear Callie, i hadn't the least idea you were so sentimental wouldn't it be a great deal more prudent to keep the money in the savings bank and draw it as you have need i will be patient with it i truly don't think it is a fortune and i presume the idea is just as silly and unbusinesslike as possible but i do so like the thought of seeing our little gold offering nestling in that pretty box and thinking that they are the lord's jewels and he will guide the using for a moment her husband was entirely silent then he said in a low tone whether it is sentimentality or not it moves me strangely perhaps we are both sentimental and perhaps it is even in so small a thing the lord's leading we will put the jewels there dear and they shall be his it was the next morning that mrs spafford having set her small house in completest order arrayed herself for the street and then sat down in the parlor opposite that box wherein she knew gleamed five golden jewels pencil and paper in hand prepared to plan her battle with life at forty-five dollars a month at her feet sat the small market basket in which was to be placed her purchases for the day the question to be determined was what could she afford to buy let me see she said making small swift figures she was as rapid an accountant in her way as her husband was in his 
thirty-one days in a month i mean to count in that way when i shall have a little surplus for extras when those good months come that have only thirty and on that blessed february we'll have a real feast i entered into a speculation her husband had explained the night before when the monthly salary was talked over i discovered that by buying a month's car tickets in advance i could get them for two dollars that is a saving of eight cents a month ninety-six cents a year i want you to understand and you will have the goodness to give me credit for the same on your day book this sentence gotten off with many a flourish ended in a laugh in which callie joined before she said now we can laugh but really that is worth a good deal suppose by careful management we can save a dollar a year on each of our expenditures we could keep a savings bank account against that rainy day that people are so fond of getting ready for i know i have met people who it seemed to me would rather trust their rainy day fund than the lord keep a bank account by all means if possible her husband had answered and he had gone away with a laugh that he did not mean his wife should know covered a little sigh no one would have liked better than he to so fill her purse that she should have no need to puzzle her brains about the small economies with which he thought he foresaw her life was to be filled but she with serene brow sat this morning fingering the bills that all told amounted to forty-three dollars forty-three dollars to be divided between thirty-one days gives me one dollar and thirty-eight cents a day and almost one cent over that one cent shall be counted on the savings bank fund i will have one if warren does laugh at me he shall not know anything about it until some dreary day when the wind is blowing and the rain is driving against the windows he staggers home and tells me he is on the eve of failure and i bring out my savings bank book and show him that the sum exactly meets his awful needs a la dime novel style whereupon she laughed aloud a free glad laugh that covered no thought of a sigh she even rejoiced that her husband's position as a mere clerk saved him from any fear of bankruptcy callie spafford had that sweet rare spirit which knows how to find cause for joy in each of the appointments of life seventy-five cents a day ought to buy our food and the fuel to cook it with i wonder if it will dear me i keep forgetting warren's lunch downtown what a pity he has to do that i could furnish him with a so much nicer one at cheaper rates well twenty-five cents a day for that is seven dollars and seventy-five cents a month what dreadful creatures figures are they go and multiply themselves so unfeelingly before one now i just wonder if we could have breakfasts and suppers each day on the fifty cents left as for my dinner that won't amount to much who wants to eat dinners all alone i don't mean to starve and i don't mean to have warren think anything looks starved but what is the harm in my experimenting as to what can be done i've wanted to try it ever since i boarded with poor mrs perkins and she gave us tough beefsteak and sour baker's bread or at all events baker's sour bread at three cents and a half a week and lost money every blessed week i don't believe a word of it i mean i don't believe she managed matters as she might if she hadn't spent so much time weeping over the hardness of her lot now callie spafford shoulder your market basket and see what you can do for a hungry family at fifty cents a day it shall be that until further notice at least oh there is callie howell a clear voice exclaimed as the young matron market basket in hand entered the narrow court which at that end of the city served as a market-place the voice belonged to one of the dear five hundred friends of her maidenhood none of them so very dear yet she was glad to see them all this one jenny west by name was one with whom she had perhaps been least familiar so far as real friendship goes but there was a ring of gladness in the voice everybody had liked callie howell the brisk young bookkeeper near whom she was standing was the first to respond miss jenny i am shocked at your familiarity 
don't you know that is not callie howell at all but mrs warren spafford yes she is callie howell i am going to forget that she has gone and spoiled our circle by consenting to be an old married woman and market-place though it was miss jenny who was perhaps at all times a trifle too loud-voiced came forward eagerly and bestowed her hearty greetings even to kisses upon the little market woman a market basket she said still speaking in loud tones do you do your own marketing how very funny why who would do it my child the matron said in no wise discomposed and she looked at the yellow feet and pink ruffle of a chicken lying near with the air of a skilled market woman mr spafford has to take the seven o'clock car down he has little time for family duties what is poultry worth to-day i'd make him get up early then and do it all before seven o'clock miss jenny interposed isn't housekeeping horrid callie i know all about it mother was away for three weeks and i had all the care of the house i thought i should die certainly and things got themselves into the awfulest confusion while she was gone oh my it makes me shiver to think of those three weeks mother said she never saw such a house how much hired help does your mother keep queried mrs spafford with an amused smile why we only keep two girls and you know we have a large house to look after and quite a family it is too much i wonder that mother doesn't die it nearly killed me now honestly callie howell you needn't laugh at me you always did laugh at me you know i was completely worn out and had to come up here to rest mrs evans is trying to nurse me up do you know mrs evans you ought to she belongs right here in your neighborhood mrs evans mrs spafford she is my dearest friend callie or she used to be before she was so foolish as to get married and wear her life out with housekeeping how you girls can do it is beyond me i don't believe we feel in the least like martyrs mrs spafford said laughing as she acknowledged this public introduction by a cordial grasp of the hand the slight fair-faced woman with a somewhat perplexed face and unnaturally flushed cheeks was the same who had attracted her admiring attention in church the sabbath before the market-place was an unpleasantly public one in which to form new acquaintances but very little in the way of propriety could be expected from jenny west so she accepted the situation laughing meantime over the thought that the gay young girl the very picture of blooming health had come up to be nursed by this fair frail woman meantime jenny had jumped to an entirely different line of thought oh eva here are strawberries don't they look perfectly lovely who would have expected to see them so early why they fairly make my mouth water you must have some of them for dessert they will be delightful with cream and sponge cake eva my dear attend to business don't you see the treasures will all be gone in a few minutes this last with a touch on the lady's arm and a pretty affectation of importance as mrs evans with cheeks heightened in color appeared to be absorbed in examining some scaly fish meantime the class of customers who were always eager for things out of season was surrounding the strawberries mrs spafford meantime seemed to have forgotten her chicken and was watching mrs evans with thoughtful eyes she turned at jenny's peremptory summons with the flush still deepening and with a hesitating air i don't know she said doubtfully well you will know in a few minutes with a half impatient little laugh they all will be gone and that will settle the question for you callie don't you want a box of these strawberries for your market basket mrs spafford was glad for this question and answered promptly no indeed i am too wise a housekeeper even to inquire the price the idea of any but millionaires buying strawberries at this time of year even then i fancy i could find happier ways of disposing of my money oh you horrid little miser you were always saving your pocket money in school 
i thought you would get over that habit when you took a husband to support you callie paid no attention to this sentence though the tone was so loud that ordinarily it would have annoyed her on the score of good breeding she was engaged in watching the effect of her words on mrs evans and was glad to see a little letting up of the look of pained perplexity and to hear her answer her gay tormentor's next appeal with something like decision i believe jenny the strawberries are too expensive for my purse to-day i didn't get enough money from dane for any special extras this morning oh you horrid housekeepers said jenny with a becoming little pout what a prosy life you must live counting the pennies and asking your husbands whenever you want even a strawberry i wouldn't be in your shoes for the world it is well you are a privileged person jenny mrs spafford answered her laughing for herself she was as indifferent as possible to what the saucy foolish tongue might say but it was evident that mrs evans winced under it she looked worn and harassed and callie as she watched her felt an unaccountable pity stealing into her heart for the pale woman and made a sudden resolve to shield her further if necessary from jenny's attacks perhaps she hasn't made a pencil and paper calculation this morning as to what she will spend and what she won't and so feels weak this she told herself by way of excusing her companionship and then plunged boldly in isn't poultry unaccountably high this morning i was going to indulge in a nice little chicken for our dinner to-night but really i can't afford it much better than the strawberries you see with a bright little smile although i have been keeping house for myself but one day i am nevertheless a practical housekeeper and i don't like to waste money on extravagant purchases i don't believe i should if i had the money to spend which i haven't mrs evans regarded her with a sudden accession of interest are you really a practical housekeeper she asked i wish i were i have been keeping house for three months but i didn't know anything about it when i commenced and i don't seem to have learned a great deal how did you learn mother and i kept house together for ten years i was a schoolgirl most of the time and a teacher during the last two years but still i was my mother's market woman confidential clerk and a good deal of the time her cook and table waiter so i learned all about it my mother was a wonderful teacher and does your mother live with you now a swift tender shadow passed over the bright face and the voice dropped lower she went away to her home a little more than a year ago mrs evans reached forth her hand and laid it impulsively on callie's my mother died nearly two years ago but i miss her so there was a real heart cry in this sentence jenny's loud voice recalled them to practical life come you two are sentimentalizing i believe and the result will be you will neither of you have anything for dinner unless i help after all i believe i could make a better housekeeper than either of you will coleman can't you come here and figure out the respective dinners of these two matrons they are in danger of starving unless some judicious person comes to their aid thus challenged the young bookkeeper got down from his perch came over and shook hands with mrs spafford and chatted with jenny he was a recent importation to that end of the city from the main store downtown he had known callie howell in their set as a teacher and he had the same feeling of hearty respect for her that she had always inspired he did not feel sufficiently intimate with her to suggest her bill of fare still he was in no sense averse to a chat with miss jenny truth to tell he had been no uninterested listener to the queer snatches of conversation that had been going on he was a rapid accountant and if miss jenny had but known it a good deal of mental arithmetic had been gotten through with during the five minutes he had speculated as to the probable amount of warren spafford's salary the probable house rent he paid the possible cost of living with such a manager as callie howell at the head of affairs all the while giving certain thoughtful glances toward miss jenny that showed whither his hopes were tending 
and then as she acknowledged her dislike for the cares of housekeeping her ignorance of details and exhibited her utter disregard for small economies not to say her contempt for the same he had drawn a little sigh and plunged into the column of figures before him still he liked to get down from his stool and come and talk with miss jenny he liked also to think that she was a friend of callie spafford that lady meantime had really not been idle she had given certain swift glances up and down the rows of eatables made her mental calculation determined what she could have and what she couldn't and was now prepared to act accordingly is the poultry very high questioned mrs evans in a sudden confidential whisper i think jenny is fond of it ruinously high and not very good at that if jenny were my guest she would have to wait for prices to lower that is true she added brightly as jenny caught the sentence and shook her pretty curly head spoil all my plans said jenny with another pretty affectation of a pout while mrs evans looked in admiring awe at her new friend for daring to avow her economies so boldly then jenny with a sudden bright smile if you'll buy some of that asparagus i'll desert eva altogether and go home with you to dinner mrs evans blushed crimson in deprecation of her friend's rudeness but callie promptly shook her head your tastes are simply ruinous she said gaily not even for the pleasure of having you to lunch with me can i be guilty of such treason you see i held a conference with my purse before i started from home this morning and i know exactly what amount i can spend to-day and it won't include chicken or asparagus or strawberries asparagus is good for digestion said jenny pointing so is a clear conscience laughed callie and the trio separated End of chapter 2chapter three of the pocket measure by pansy this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three cake and benevolence mrs evans stirred her coffee with an irresolute air occasionally studying that portion of her husband's face which could be seen from behind the morning paper she had that to say to him which always made his face grow more or less gloomy she was trying to decide whether this was a propitious time though daily growing more doubtful as to whether there would ever be a propitious time for like topics presently determining that whether safe or not it must be done she entered her hesitating interruption dane if you have a few minutes for me this morning i would like to talk with you the paper dropped promptly and the husband waited courteously enough but in silence and with a face that told of habitual perplexity in some direction perhaps in many i think i shall be obliged to have a little more money to-day that is if we bake for the festival the ladies are going around this afternoon to see what each one will do and i suppose i shall have to say what our part will be i thought they hadn't decided yet whether to have a festival or not well it isn't quite decided that is part of the work of the committee this afternoon to see whether the people approve of the festival and if so what they will give toward it then if i were you i would say i didn't approve i'm sure i don't the whole thing is a first-class nuisance from beginning to end i never approved of that way of doing business and i don't change my opinion as i grow older and the husband who could not have been more than thirty at the utmost albeit he talked so wisely about growing older drank his coffee almost scalding hot and ate his steak and baked potato rapidly with a gloomy face yes but dane i don't suppose our opinion will be asked in fact they have taken it for granted that we are in sympathy with them i am on this very committee for soliciting this afternoon i wouldn't have served of all hateful business that a woman can do i should think that would be the meanest talk about drudgery i'd rather drudge at the wash-tub all day if i were a woman than to tramp all day through dirty streets stopping at people's houses begging them to give 
i shouldn't say you were suited to that sort of work mrs evans checked a troubled little sigh and tried to smile as she said oh well i don't suppose i will need to say much i am just chosen for company mrs bacon is to go with me or rather i am to go with her she is a good solicitor they say the gloomy-faced husband sneered i should think very likely she would be she has just about impudence enough for such work well now mr evans she says to me don't you really think you ought to do a little more for the sake of the cause for the sake of the fiddlestick as if a man didn't know his own business without having mrs bacon trot after him to tell him of it she cares about as much for the cause as her yellow-haired poodle does i wish if they must put you to such disagreeable positions they would at least send you out with a woman who has common sense it is wretched poor policy in them to send her if people are any like me i always give at least twenty-five cents less than i would if anybody else asked me how came they to choose you almost a stranger for such work wasn't there anybody else willing to be imposed upon this time mrs evans's sigh was not suppressed i hardly knew how to refuse she said at length hesitatingly they knew i had very little to do in fact they mentioned me as one who had leisure and i thought perhaps i might help a little in that way i always used to help at home in whatever way i could help mr evans's voice was getting into a regular growl who are you helping pray don't get into the habit of talking that nonsense about the good of the cause that will do for idiots like mrs bacon to peep i wish to goodness there was a church to be found that didn't undertake to pay its honest debts with cake i believe i'd move to-morrow and go into its vicinity i'm tired of this eternal begging to get stuff to put into people's stomachs and let them call it benevolence i wouldn't have anything to do with it eva if i were you mrs evans's naturally pale cheeks were a deep crimson now she protested earnestly but dane how can i help it we belong to this congregation and i at least am pledged to do what i can for its support i thought you wanted me to help in any way that i could and i really didn't see how to refuse there was a little quiver in her voice such as always subdued the tendency to growl in her husband's he drank his coffee more slowly oh of course he said at last i suppose you are in for it i'm not blaming you eva you understand but i hate the system all the same so do all honest men that is the reason i hate to see you mixed up with it in the name of a church too well how much money must you have this question set mrs evans to cutting her steak nervously into little bits i don't know just how much money it takes to make cake dane but we are out of sugar and the butter will not last if i have it used for cake too then i shall need eggs and raisins i suppose or flavoring of some sort i never calculated the price of cake dane i just used to go down to the kitchen and weigh out whatever materials i needed and make my cake without any regard to expense so i don't know how to plan i wish women ever did sit down and calculate the expense of cake they would discover that it is an awfully extravagant way to be benevolent but eva how does it happen that we are out of sugar again it can't be two weeks since i sent up that great box full the fair blue eyes were swimming in tears and the wife's voice was half choked as she answered i'm sure i don't know kate seems to be careful with the sugar but we have been using a good deal of fruit lately you know since jenny was here and puddings and custards take a great deal it seems i never used to think so but they do i have really tried dane to look after it and be as careful as possible but the sugar goes in spite of me i'm almost discouraged poor little mouse with an attempt at a laugh you can't keep track of the sugar eh i have a suspicion that your husband's fondness for apples baked in sugar may account for some of it besides ants sometimes make havoc with sugar you know this time i think it is cousins i never could quite understand how jenny west happened to be your cousin i'm glad it is two removes 
third cousin isn't she second mrs evans answered meekly she knew her husband was not fond of jenny well i wish you could teach her a few lessons in common politeness i never supposed it was etiquette for a guest to arrange the bill of fare when is she coming back not until next week shall i make two cakes dane or would you say you could only furnish one oh i suppose you will have to do what the rest do if they say two we say two that's the benevolence of it but now seriously eva this matter must be carefully considered i have a pretty good salary you know so called and there are only two of us and yet we are running behind all the time we went to housekeeping you remember to save money and we are spending it as fast again as when we were boarding in fact we are spending more than i get running in debt you understand and nothing to pay it with unless we begin to save somewhere i don't understand these things but i suppose you women do and it will have to be looked into closely kate wastes i presume all girls do at least that is what will coleman says his mother says will by the way is wonderfully interested in the expenses of housekeeping i told him it was ten times cheaper to board now my dear i hate this whole business i'd like to feed you on fruit cake and dress you in silk velvet if i could but you see the trouble is we can't do what we can't either for ourselves or for others this cake matter must be attended to now i suppose but when we have a little time we must talk it over and see if we can't think our way out before another festival or fair or something of the sort pounces down on us as to money i haven't but two dollars to my name i'll give you one of them and send up the sugar and eggs from bacon's i'll tell him to charge them to benevolence there comes my confounded car we must contrive to get around earlier in the mornings mind i'm not blaming you wifey you do your best i dare say i must go this minute and he bent over her with a hasty farewell kiss and strode through the dining room in haste whistled the already passed car and was off for the day mrs evans sat still where he had left her stirring the fast cooling coffee pushed her fork into the untasted bits of steak and drew it out again and presently arose from her uneaten breakfast touched her little silver call bell for kate and walked away to the sitting-room before she came to hide the flushed face and tearful eyes there were unmistakable tears in the eyes now it seemed to her that she had reached the extreme limit of endurance in this matter it was all so different from what she in her girlhood days had planned she had been one of those petted only daughters in a beautiful home father and mother had vied with each other in surrounding her life with sunlight her tastes had been comparatively simple her ideas quiet therefore she had not needed what people of wealth would call large sums of money with which to carry out her plans so to her mind money had always been plenty she had only to ask for what she wanted and it was invariably forthcoming given with a smile and a kiss her father was not wealthy he was simply well-to-do but even this she did not know he might be very rich for all she thought about it he certainly was not poor it was with her in all her relations in life exactly as she had explained about the cake when she had wanted to do anything she did it asking no questions giving no thought as to expense she had been benevolent in a sense that is she had taken her place in the church work not as a leader she was not destined by nature for a leader and she had not grace enough to assume the position but when the fairs or festivals or benevolent associations of any sort sprang into periodical activity and the managers thereof talked cake and cream and oysters or tidies and pincushions and toilet sets as a way out of debt or into opulence she unhesitatingly and sweetly bore her share of the burden indeed hers was apt to be among the first voices to say i will make cake or we can furnish cream at our house or you can use our parlors all these things were pleasant to her were in no sense sacrifices were done spontaneously 
giving as a matter of principle she knew nothing about and yet like so many others she thought she knew all about it less than two years before this day of which i am telling you the pleasant thread of life that had unravelled so smoothly before her suddenly snapped asunder at least one of the main strands gave out without word of warning in the morning the father went away kissing his wife kissing his daughter as usual in the evening he lay cold and silent in his parlour never again to be a living presence there from this shock the gentle mother never rallied but sank almost immediately into a state of invalidism nurtured and lovingly thought of day and night by the daughter whose purse opened lavishly as usual to supply her needs until one morning she awoke rudely to the frightful fact that the money was gone the well-to-do man of business had been like many another living beyond his means and had left nothing but five hundred dollars in cash for his wife and child to live on even the pretty home that had been theirs ever since the daughter was born went to pay the outstanding debts as for the five hundred dollars it melted away like snow in springtime the daughter had not the slightest idea where she had never been taught to manage money of one thing she was glad at least she came to be glad after the first stunning sense of grief was over that her mother had no need to know of this later blow she sank away out of life sooner than any had feared soon enough to fondly suppose that she left her daughter mistress of the home and with plenty of money at her disposal as heretofore and there was barely enough to furnish the requisite amount of crape and pay the enormous bills for carriage hire all of these sad events hurrying so rapidly on each other had in their turn hastened the marriage of the daughter to the enterprising young clerk of the firm of briggs and bowen a clerk who was said to be receiving an unusually good salary for a man of his years and his young wife if she had thought of it at all which she didn't would have imagined a thousand dollars a year to be a small fortune as for dane evans he was the sort of a young man who knew that it had been amply sufficient for his wants therefore it would do very well for both of them as soon then as the customs of society would admit for i suppose you surmise by this time that these people were both of the class who pay careful attention to the customs of society they were married and organized their home very much as if they had five thousand a year to depend upon instead of a thousand their first rude awakening was the discovery that the fashionable boarding-house which had been a home to mr evans for five years would not do for the two or in other words that twenty dollars a week for board fuel and lights extra was simply not to be thought of they went higher not in price but in stairs and tried sixteen dollars a week and were appalled to discover that even this painful reduction left them in debt and their necessities increasing every hour what was to be done after many talks and some tears on the wife's part at least they concluded to try housekeeping eva being sure that it must be cheaper a great deal for mamma never had any trouble at that time her husband was too young and too fond a husband to sneer but he smiled and did not remind her that he himself was only a clerk while her father was at least supposed to be the sole owner of a good business then began a wearisome round of house hunting then too did the young couple take their first lesson in rents they were amazed and utterly dismayed to discover that the whole salary would not pay for what they were pleased to consider a suitable house in a decent neighborhood they tried other neighborhoods they climbed higher and higher toward the limits of the city and at last found fully six miles away from the centre the queer little box in which they now lived that was the husband's name for it and certainly to them both it was unlike any house of their experience yet it was a pretty enough house and even up here the price to be paid was something that made them give doubtful glances at each other they were growing wiser as to the capabilities of a thousand dollars a year yet not much 
else they would never have spent nearly that sum in furnishing the house the young husband who had been receiving his salary of a thousand dollars for five years had in the days of his bachelorhood managed to save a trifle over two hundred a year and congratulated himself often upon being a thrifty fellow he did do better than many a young man of his acquaintance this thousand carefully invested as it had been was drawn out and furnished the rented house with pretty carpets and delicately upholstered furniture for the parlors and spare chamber eva the wife was gifted with rare taste in this matter of house furnishing and if she had not been restricted in means could have made the queer little house into a bower of beauty as it was she believed herself to have been a martyr she had crucified her tastes in a dozen particulars she had studied economy until her fair face was wrinkled and troubled and yet the thousand dollars vanished in the most extraordinary manner long before the house was completely furnished the means were gone and as is usual in such cases it was the kitchen and the everyday living rooms that had to suffer then began a season of daily struggles with kitchen expenses sugars and teas and coffees and oils and meats and coal and all the long long list of necessities poor eva wrestled with them and tried to plan and save and was afraid of her girl in the kitchen and afraid of her pantry and afraid of her pocket-book and grew to hate the very name of sugar and yet week by week the bills and expenses increased and her husband's face grew graver and his tones were growing occasionally a little sharp even to her and she saw no way out of the problem what was she to do here was this fearful church supper looming up before her when had she ever shrunk from a church supper before she hated the very thought of it now and this thought made her cheeks glow with shame she hated to have to hate such expenditures she wanted to give to be benevolent in her narrow understanding of the term she liked to be able to smile and say oh certainly when the cake or coffee question came up it made her blush like a criminal to think that possibly the time was coming when she really must say i can't afford to do thus and so her unfortunate education had been that some way it was a confession of sin to be obliged to say i can't afford it she was learning through bitter experience to look ahead a little she had pored over figures enough lately to discover that even going on as they had been and she could not see how it was possible for them to live on less than they did would plunge them into debt she saw that dane's face was constantly troubled that he shrank from any conversation or suggestion that would involve outlay that he read the morning paper a great deal for fear she would ask him for money for dinner or to pay kate it seemed to the poor bewildered wife that kate was always needing to be paid it made her wince and flush to take the three dollars weekly from her delicate gold-mounted portemonnaie and bestow it on the great good-natured german who daily scorched their steak and served them muddy coffee every expenditure made her wince her second cousin jenny west had been like a long nightmare to her during the ten days of her visit and she shivered to think of her coming back next week she rubbed the steam made by her breath from the window-pane with her delicate cambric handkerchief then stared guiltily to see the soil and to remember that even that little act had added another item to the weekly wash which was another of her trials church suppers looked like anything but interesting inventions to her and there was no use to wipe the window-pane for the tears were falling on it thick and fast End of chapter 3「Chapter 4 of the Pocket Measure by Pansy. The Slibrivox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4. Cake Mathematically Considered. Viewed from some standpoints, Mrs. Harvey Bacon, dressed for a trip to secure contributions with which to carry on a church festival for the purpose of paying a church debt, was a curiosity 
as she waited in mrs evans's neat little parlor casting pleased glances about her on the taste everywhere displayed critical eyes also for she could tell to the fraction of a dollar the cost of every article an interested person might have studied her she was arrayed in the costliest of black silks carefully made and more carefully trimmed not fussy by any means and indeed to an unpractised eye i am not sure but it would have been called very neat and plain if you have ever heard wise gentlemen discourse on the subject of dress selecting the individual whom they would like their wives to copy you are aware that they are apt to select material at four dollars a yard and lace at seven or eight and pronounce the toilet very neat and plain mrs bacon's outer garments matched her dress her silk mantle made in the newest style and trimmed without regard to cost and her delicate spring hat with its long plumes and its broad satin ties were entirely in keeping with each other and the whole effect was pleasing in the extreme if viewed by a person who had no occasion to think of dollars and cents in the same connection she gave mrs evans a swift critical glance as she came down ready for the street and was satisfied there was nothing in her appearance to make a discord the dress it is true was not so rich nor the sack and hat so costly as her own but they were rich enough to make a very respectable appearance and were in perfect taste on the whole mrs bacon was pleased i hardly know where to call first she remarked as they carefully held their skirts from contact with the spring mud and crossed the street preparatory to going down green avenue i suppose it is not worth while to make any stops on this street scarcely a person living here is able to contribute anything if they felt ever so much disposed my dear mrs evans how came you to locate on this street the people will be so uncongenial i am afraid so unlike what you must have been accustomed to don't you find it very lonely mrs evans with pink cheeks explained that she had done very well during the short time that she had lived there and met some rather pleasant people she ignored entirely the question as to the reason for her choice of residence because she actually had not the moral courage to explain that the lower rents had been the attraction to the street i am so sorry you live up so far explained her companion i told mr bacon i couldn't think what your husband meant by isolating you so from us all why nearly all our set live down at the lower end of green avenue such a walk and during the calling hours of the day there is never a car along at the right time i had to wait twenty minutes for one to-day i hope you haven't taken the house for a year as i am almost sure you will want to get further down before the season is over in almost trembling haste mrs evans assured her that they had leased the house for a year the bare thought of incurring the expense of another removal was appalling to her then she made haste to change the subject mrs bacon have you met mrs spafford they are quite recently moved here i believe and live nearly two blocks above us wouldn't it be well for us to call there before going to the avenue why would you call there do you think questioned mrs bacon stopping near the corner irresolutely i have heard of them and i am told that they are very poor indeed not even the necessities of life sad isn't it who was it told me about them oh i know your cousin miss west was telling me last week we were walking downtown together and we happened to meet mrs spafford and i was remarking upon what a fine walk she had quite as though she belonged to the cultured portion of society i understood miss west that she had known her as a girl and that she was quite a superior person what a pity it is that she married so badly do you really think it is worth while to take up our time in calling there why explained mrs evans dismay as well as genuine interest in her tones has she married badly i did not know it is her husband dissipated and a vision of the bright face that had beamed on her so hopefully and cheerily in the market overclouded with bitter sorrow came upon her calling forth sympathy oh dear no i didn't mean in that sense 
he is a very estimable person i believe at least i have heard so but i really don't know much about him but he is only a clerk i mean she hastened to explain catching a sight of the crimson cheeks of the wife of the clerk beside her he is a very young clerk indeed has a subordinate position and a meagre salary not a suitable one to marry on you know and really from what your cousin said i shouldn't be surprised if we should be called on to help them before long it is such a pity that people will foolishly throw themselves right into the responsibilities of life miss west said she never felt so sorry for any person in her life as she did when she met mrs spafford one day in the market struggling to buy something for dinner she said she had to twist and turn in order to get anything and that it was really pitiable to see her for she had been used to better things jenny talks at random sometimes responded mrs evans speaking quickly and feeling ashamed that her cousin had been guilty of talking over the affairs of one whom she called her friend to a comparative stranger like mrs bacon what might she not have told that worthy lady about their own affairs hers and dane's well said mrs bacon still irresolute taking slow steps forward perhaps it would be as well to call on her people like to be counted in even when they can't help any and as you say she may feel hurt if we pass her by had mrs evans said that she could not remember anything of the sort mrs spafford had not impressed her as a woman who would feel hurt over the fancied slights of even mrs bacon what a perfectly comical little house was the elder lady's exclamation as they passed around the neat grass plat that led to mrs spafford's door it really doesn't look as though there were room for even two children to play at housekeeping poor thing what a doleful time she must have away up here if she really has any culture the poor thing looked very unlike an object of pity she answered her own bell appearing at the door in a neat spring suit of delicate design and careful finish and ushered them into her bit of a parlor with evident pleasure at the sight of their faces i was wondering only to-day she said with a bright look bestowed upon mrs evans whether your sense of hospitality would not lead you soon to call on me jenny promised to bring you i remember she is not with you now while mrs evans explained the third lady regarded their hostess with wondering eyes are you intimately acquainted with miss west she asked as soon as opportunity afforded oh yes we were intimate in school after the manner of schoolgirls you know we were in the same classes and occasionally appeared as rivals in some of the examinations i have seen but little of her since i commenced teaching as soon as i graduated and jenny commenced party-going and both the occupations proving absorbing we saw each other rarely a poor school ma'am who married for a home was mrs bacon's mental comment poor thing what a dismal little home she has secured though i must say she has done wonders in the way of disposing of her few things what a curious parlor ornament a jewel case i wonder if she has any jewels to put in it the three ladies talked pleasantly together for a little mrs bacon acknowledging to herself that the unfortunate woman was certainly a person of a good deal of culture and finally since she was proving herself so intelligent she determined to broach the subject of the church festival such persons often help a great deal by their executive ability and their skill in setting tables and the like she told herself before she launched forth but mrs spafford proved not to be a person easy to explain things to she developed into an animated interrogation point asking questions right and left as to what had been done in the past what was hoped for in the future what had been the success of others in the same line and a dozen other embarrassing questions what is the debt she inquired abruptly at the close of a long sentence from mrs bacon about sacrificing for the good of the cause what is the amount why said mrs bacon with an embarrassed little laugh it is only a hundred dollars all told 
but you would be surprised to know how long it has hung on us you see the church is small and by no means wealthy in fact i think there are very few persons in it who can really be said to be wealthy mr bacon and i are from the clark place church and you may imagine it is a change to us but we thought it our duty to cast in our lot here and help along what we could though we have never taken our letters from the clark place church and of course have to help there and can't do so much here but we cheerfully give our mites and she brushed an imaginary particle of dust complacently from the rich silk and looked the picture of serene benevolence waiting for mrs spafford to state her ability or inability to furnish cake how much money do you hope to realize from this festival was the next question well of course we cannot estimate much about that we have a very fair attendance generally and sometimes make as much as well i've known us to clear forty dollars in an evening but then we are not apt to do as well as that ice cream is so expensive you know and but little of the cream is donated that is almost as scarce an article as money in this region i should say if we cleared thirty-five dollars we are doing very well shouldn't you think so mrs evans and mrs evans who had thought nothing about it in any way save to feel with dismay that she must bear her share of the expense whether she felt able or not from force of habit sweetly acquiesced in this statement thirty five dollars net was the next clear-cut question i mean exclusive of all expenses cake time and the wear and tear if you can estimate that mrs bacon arched her eyebrows in astonishment why dear me she said at last we don't estimate the price of cake of course that is a free will offering so indeed are our time and strength we don't expect to be paid for those i presume not spoken with dancing eyes but as a business matter you expect to estimate them and discover how much you have actually made of course it takes money to make cake and of course if i can afford to make cake i can afford to give the money outright that it would cost to make it and if in addition to that i could do something with my time by which i could increase the amount it behooves me as a sensitive business woman to discover how much net profit there is in the enterprise to mrs bacon this was certainly a new way of presenting the entire subject so indeed it was to mrs evans she looked her astonishment mingled with genuine interest in the matter and was betrayed into inquiring further my dear mrs spafford don't you think there are some people who having little or no money to give can by making cake and such things help along cake and such things are money replied mrs spafford with a smile therein lies the difficulty in my opinion people who unhesitatingly tell you they have no money to give will unhesitatingly agree to furnish a rich cake or an unlimited number of sandwiches without seeming to have an idea that they have thereby furnished money i perceive that you belong to the class of people who do not approve of social gatherings connected with the church of course we were not aware of that or we should not have intruded mrs bacon's voice reminded one just a little of a winter day her hostess turned toward her brightly oh not at all on the contrary i am one who thinks the church is not social enough i would have a great many more gatherings in the name of the church and for the cause of christ than there are now but i thought you were talking about paying a church debt and the quickest and easiest way of doing it but suppose you can combine the two objects is there any harm in that i beg pardon but i don't believe they combine well people never succeed in being very social who have come together for the purpose of making money and the people who are obliged to feel that they have contributed to the cause only by eating some of the cake and cream and paying a fair price for the same seem never to be able to look with comfortable consciences on the affair and it really seems to me a waste of effort i have often helped in these enterprises and we almost invariably fell short of the amount we had hoped to make and offended one or two persons and tired ourselves out and went home disheartened 
this was so entirely mrs evans's experience that she could not help bestowing a smile of approval on the bright-faced lady while mrs bacon still with the air of one who had been defrauded of her position as leading speaker said pray how would you raise this church debt if you had your way well said mrs spafford briskly in the first place i should make an estimate wait let me get pencil and paper i have been a school-teacher for so long that i am very fond of actual estimates put in black and white now how many cakes for instance did you propose to secure we calculated about twenty i think did we not was mrs evans's timid appeal to mrs bacon who chose to maintain a dignified silence isn't that a very large number questioned the mathematician stopping her pencil poised in air mrs bacon was tempted to explain we are liable to have quite a large attendance and our young people are apt to try two or three kinds and it is so unpleasant to run out of cake that we decided to secure as many as that number some of the committee always stand willing to buy them if there are any left well twenty cakes then of twenty different people oh dear no we haven't more than ten people on whom we can depend in the matter of cake making it is by no means a large church mrs spafford very well then ten persons twenty cakes of what sort mrs bacon well said that lady growing interested despite her determination not to be we let each person make what she chooses we want nice rich cakes of course and that is generally understood so we don't dictate as to the precise kind frosted why yes generally our cakes have been frosted they look prettier you know for a festival and what price would you set as the valuation of each cake then the two ladies looked at each other doubtfully i haven't the least idea said mrs evans who nevertheless was deeply interested in the question being anxious to know whether it would be possible that dane was right and cake was an extravagant way of being benevolent i'm sure i don't know said mrs bacon with a little laugh who ever heard of estimating the cost of cake oh i've estimated it often said the mathematician making neat little figures on her paper it is very easily calculated the average expense you know suppose we say half a pound of butter to a cake that is a fair average for some of the cake makers will be sure to use more and some less butter is forty cents a pound now so we have twenty cents next we have eggs and i suppose six to a cake is as low an average as frosted cake will admit of or to be very economical shall we say four eggs are somewhat scarce now you know thirty cents a dozen a third of a dozen ten cents now the sugar i am always amazed at the way sugar disappears it is such insignificant looking stuff and costs so little by the pound that you think it is hardly worth calculating yet most housekeepers find that it insists on being calculated yes indeed said mrs evans with a sympathetic laugh and a bitter memory of her constantly emptying sugar box let me see frosting takes a great deal of sugar and pulverized sugars are expensive i don't think that allowing ten cents for each cake is too much in fact i'm inclined to think it is hardly enough but we want to make the estimate as low as possible so i'll put in ten now counting flour and flavoring and milk do you really believe a fairly good cake can be made for fifty cents i don't to this both ladies agreed and each of them knew so much or so little about money that they felt slightly triumphant certainly fifty cents was a very small sum to give for benevolence very well then mrs evans if you make two cakes you will give one dollar to the cause counting out entirely your time and strength which in this age of the world should certainly be worth something to every woman ten other ladies do the same and the cake is secured then come the coffee and the cream and the sandwiches and the pickles and the fruits and so forth and ever so many other and so forths besides the dishes that will certainly get broken and have to be replaced and the dresses that will be sure to get stained with coffee or something 
that is part of the program you know to tip something over and when you have made a conscientious estimate of the whole matter how much net profit have you end of chapter four chapter five of the pocket measure by pansy this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five interrogation points then the ladies looked at each other again mrs evans could not resist the temptation to laugh a little she had never been statistical before and she was vaguely surprised and a good deal amused that the results were so small as for mrs bacon her face expressed as much annoyance as a well-bred face allows itself to show in a lady's parlour it is possible that she had been brought face to face with inexorable figures before i think i must be obtuse she said speaking coldly but i fail to see as yet any plan proposed by which more can be raised than we can secure in this way mrs spafford laid aside her pencil and paper i beg your pardon she said courteously i did not propose to interfere with your plans i was talking for my own information as much as anything i have been led to think a good deal about these matters of late and i was wondering whether a much more comfortable way would not be to raise the money at once oh undoubtedly you need not fear any opposition as to that opinion mrs bacon said with a little laugh that was almost disagreeable i assure you we don't bake cake and prepare refreshments merely for amusement we are capable of entertaining ourselves in pleasanter ways we would very much prefer to raise the money outright if it could be done but the lamentable fact is that it cannot i don't see why mrs spafford was not one to be turned aside from her purpose by a bit of sarcasm what would have flushed mrs evans cheek and hushed her voice only roused in this woman a determination to prove her point now let me suppose for the sake of the illustration that you have twenty ladies who will assist in getting up this entertainment at an expense to themselves exclusive of their time of fifty cents each is that sufficiently low mrs bacon that lady under direct appeal was obliged to admit that she should be surprised to get off with so little personal expenditure as that that is she added if you count cake and such things i have never been accustomed to taking note of such trifling expenditures whereupon mrs evans immediately thought of her husband and of his stormily expressed wish that people ever would calculate such expenditures then according to your estimate something of this sort must be resorted to four or five times before the amount is raised now why would not the twenty ladies rather pledge themselves to give say fifty cents a month for ten months and save their strength and their dresses my dear madam i am afraid you are a novice in church work mrs evans how would you like to go around to our ladies and make such a bold proposition as that wouldn't you be afraid of being told that they were capable of expending their own money without our assistance mrs evans's cheeks were crimson and she evidently knew not what answer to make so her hostess feeling sorry for her came to the rescue i don't believe she is afraid of any such thing surely no lady would be guilty of such language besides it is really a trifle less than you are preparing to do if i understand your mission you propose to ask the ladies to take the fifty cents and spend it on a cake and spend their strength in making it and then come and wait on people while they eat it surely my proposition is the simpler of the two but then you know we only ask it for once ventured mrs evans ah yes but that doesn't pay the debt doesn't begin to pay it and of course their penetration is equal to seeing that they will be called upon again and again in the same direction but my dear mrs spafford you don't understand people who would be annoyed by the very suggestion that they ought to give money will bake beautiful cake for us you see they don't realize that it is the same as money and so they are willing to help in that way when you cannot get a cent of money out of them 
mrs spafford who had been conducting the conversation up to this point in a half laughing way was grave enough now as she said gently isn't that one of the objections to these ways of raising money self-deceived people who have never given much thought to domestic economy are led into cake makings that they can ill afford under the mistaken impression that they are giving for the cause of christ and other people come to festivals and buy their cake and cream and mats and tidies under the mistaken impression that they are giving to the church when in reality they are receiving a full and fair equivalent for their money where is the real giving in any of these plans well said mrs bacon i'm sure i don't profess to understand all these nice points mrs evans and i have been appointed by the church to do its drudgery and i suppose we must do it leaving to you school teachers the discussion of metaphysics mrs spafford's eyes danced mischievously her caller's ideas regarding metaphysics were evidently mixed but she saw that it would be wisdom to leave the subject well she said brightly i didn't mean to discuss domestic economy or church economies either when i commenced i hope you will have success in your mission as for myself i will bake the two cakes or give the dollar whichever you say of course as a matter of economy i would rather give the dollar yet i am willing to do the other way if it will please you better and if you decide to make an effort for the money instead of the cake you may count me as one of the ladies pledged to fifty cents a month for ten months or let me see you are paying interest i suppose then we ought to say for twelve months that would cover the interest and leave a little bit of a surplus for something else then she turned at once from the entire subject and began to question in regard to other matters what sort of benevolent work was the church doing had they a sewing society she saw a great many poorly clad children as she went up and down the streets were they in the sabbath school didn't they need clothing were their parents attending any church was the church interested in home mission work were the prayer meetings well attended had they a ladies prayer meeting a perfect storm of questions mrs evans gave up the slightest attempt at answer and sat a silent and interested listener while mrs bacon attempted to impart information as to poor children there were swarms of them belonging to worthless people for whom nothing satisfactory could be done she was not aware that any organized effort had been made to reach them oh dear no the parents never thought of attending church home mission work oh yes of course an annual collection was taken for home missions she really didn't know how much was contributed no it wasn't sent to any special field so far as she knew just applied for the general good a ladies prayer meeting no their ladies not being quakers had no objection to attending prayer meeting in company with their husbands she really could not say whether the general prayer meeting was well attended or not it was such a long walk for her and mr bacon was so late in getting from the city that they rarely got to prayer meeting a trifle embarrassing were many of the questions it was so apparent even to mrs bacon that efficient woman that she was when put through a regular course of cross-examination she knew very little about the practical work of the church did you hear anything like it was her exclamation to mrs evans almost before their hostess's door had closed after them calculating the price of the sugar and flour and milk that are used in cake she must be a mercenary little body anyway but then i suppose poor thing her circumstances make it necessary that is one of the difficulties inseparably connected with poverty people grow so small in their reasonings narrow down their lives to such trivial calculations the price of a cup of sugar and a few eggs dear me isn't it depressing mrs evans's answer was an inarticulate murmur she was unaccountably interested in the brisk little accountant and her deft figures what if she should be able to learn of this woman so as to make figures that their weekly expenses would come within the week's legitimate allowance and so remove the wrinkles from dane's forehead if she thought that she would certainly ask to become her pupil 
thinking it over she gained courage to offer a timid demur but mrs bacon she seemed very willing to help after all and was as liberal as most people you know she said she would pledge herself to give fifty cents a month until the debt was paid i don't believe we could find a great many other ladies who would do the same mrs bacon laughed she doesn't believe we would either she is entirely safe in making the proposition that sort of giving is easy for instance i would just as soon as not offer to be one of fifty to give a thousand dollars for a new church to be built this season do you suppose i would ever be called upon to pay it but fifty cents a month isn't so very much said mrs evans doubtfully disturbed by the speciousness of the illustration yet unwilling to give mrs spafford over as a quick-witted hypocrite oh no it isn't much it sounds like a very business-like suggestion but it would involve endless rounds by committees and much talking and amount to very little in the end some of us of course will have to give a great deal more than that to make up for the delinquencies of others but as i said it sounds well besides teachers are so accustomed to a sort of red tape arrangement of matters you know that it seems to them reasoning from their narrow spheres as though everything in life could be reduced to figures and added and subtracted poor mrs evans thought with a weary sigh that almost everything in her life had been reduced to figures and that an alarming subtracting process was always going on but she had said all that in her timidity she dared to say in defence of mrs spafford save this born partly of her own mental wanderings over the matter and partly because of an earnest desire to suppress gossip cousin jenny must have been mistaken in her surmise that they were very poor for she was as ready to make the cake or give its equivalent as any lady could be oh as to that i don't know she is probably one who has resolved to make as good a showing as she can out of nothing and what she lacks in funds make up in argument some people will do almost anything to maintain before the public a position that is not theirs by right this sentence made her companion wince inwardly truth to tell she was sometimes troubled with grave doubts as to whether she and dane were not trying to do that very thing and she wished within her weary soul that she could find her own level wherever it was and step down into it and be at peace but she went home and in due time went into her kitchen and measured her flour and weighed her butter and sugar and beat her eggs and stirred her rich compound with skilful hand there was one redeeming feature about cake she knew how to make it she felt almost certain of the result her practised eye could tell by a critical glance at the sticky compound whether there was just flour enough or whether it needed a trifle more and her practised hand could tell by the very feel of the spoon in the mass whether it had been stirred to just the right degree of lightness the obnoxious kate was engaged at that very hour in moulding the bread and as she looked with doubtful eyes on the soggy lump that kate was tossing and rolling and thumping her red knuckles into the mistress wished from the depths of her heart that she knew as much about that suspicious-looking lump as she did about the batter before her she felt certain that the results of such knowledge would have brought smiles to dane's face but alas she knew nothing about bread so kate pounded away making her sour mass of dough grow every minute more soggy and the skilled mistress prepared her tins and dropped her batter skilfully into it and felt of the heat in the oven still with a practised hand and held like a general at her post through all the processes until her loaves came out just the requisite shade of creamy brown then while kate went to the cellar for coal she hurriedly lifted the cloth and gave a surreptitious glance at the lump of dough it looked discouraging and smelled uninviting and she turned from it sighing and went away by this time you are aware that the project for raising the money without the cake was not carried out in fact it was not considered for a moment 
i am not sure that any besides the cake committee even heard of it mrs bacon chose not to say anything about it and mrs evans had not moral courage enough to do so unhelped by others therefore mrs spafford's skilful figures so far as she knew dropped uselessly into oblivion it was not so they lingered in the troubled young housekeeper's heart her perplexities did not lessen she was inclined to think before she finished her rich cake that mrs spafford's estimate had been entirely too low and so indeed it was for her individual cake she knew nothing about averages the weekly accounts loomed up before her larger than ever the wrinkles in her husband's forehead seemed daily to grow and he studied the morning paper more industriously and conversed less the festival was held and mrs evans's dishes were lent to help set the table and two of her delicate cups were dashed into fragments she had not the courage to suggest that they be replaced before the pattern became obsolete besides she was one of the unfortunate victims on whom the traditional cup of coffee spilled and of course she wore to the festival a dress that coffee stains hopelessly ruined she looked at it ruefully one of her bridal stock of dresses and calculated what it would cost to replace that in her wardrobe and her eyes opened by mrs spafford's figures she could not help sitting down and deliberately calculating how much she could have paid toward the church debt supposing she had known that two of her cups and one of her dresses were to be added to the cake and was alarmed at the sum total and resolved then and there that at the very first opportunity she would certainly learn from mrs spafford exactly how she managed both the household expenses and the cake question for mrs spafford came to the festival and with her came two cakes as carefully made and as satisfactory in results as were mrs evans's own she belonged to the class of workers who failing in leading in what they firmly believe would be a better way are able gracefully to drop into the accepted way doing heartily their share often more than their share even though the way of doing it is not of their choosing biding their time and looking steadily to an improved future such people invariably become leaders in the end one bit of information did mrs evans seek do you know mr spafford she asked her husband on one of those mornings when he read his paper less than usual spafford who clerks it for the holdens yes i know him when i meet him on the street car we have never been formally introduced but we chat together coming up he is an intelligent fellow i enjoy talking with him do you know what his salary is this question was timidly put whatever had to do with money either directly or remotely was sure to bring the wrinkles they came creeping up his forehead at this moment and he answered in a changed tone i do to a penny he gets six hundred dollars a year six hundred exactly that and commenced housekeeping on a surplus of two hundred and fifty which he had saved goodness knows how and doesn't owe a penny and i get a thousand a year and run behind all the time perhaps his wife has money this was mrs evans's tremulous suggestion and at that moment she almost felt as though she would sell her right arm for the sake of being a wife who had money the gloomy-faced husband shook his head vigorously no she hasn't i knew carrie howell by reputation at least she supported her mother for years and was considered a marvel for the way in which she managed people used to wonder how she kept herself and her mother looking so trim and comfortable and their little home sunny there is witch work about some people's lives i never could understand it and i don't want to try just pass me that paper please and he gave himself to the study of current items End of chapter five